So hello, welcome to another installment of the Curling Educational Series, which tonight is brought to you by the Curler Outreach Program, us and the GNCC as kind of a continuation of their college curling based education. Um, as you, you may have seen in the, in the description of the event, the GNCC definitely takes a lot of pride and has had a lot of success in providing resources to college curlers. They really are an advocate for them. So the college curlers did receive priority for this registration, uh, but we're really happy to, to partner with GNCC to boost this event and very, very happy to welcome everyone in attendance, college curlers or not. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I did just launch the curling demographic poll to see who we were able to reach tonight in our audience. All answers are anonymous. So if you could complete that for us and submit your, your results, we would really appreciate um, those data points that can help make this type of content more relevant and accessible to whoever's here tonight. Um, as a reminder, please keep yourself muted. You may always keep your video on so we can see your wonderful faces, but please stay muted unless you have a question, in which case you can raise your Zoom hand, unmute, um, or please use the chat. That would be wonderful as well. We'll be monitoring that all night. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to uh, Mary Jane, or you may know her as MJ, MJ Walsh your GNCC college curling moderator for this evening until she has to leave for a curling game and then I'll help out. Um, and also Matt Shiner, which is your speaker for this evening regarding basic strategy. MJ, Matt, thank you so much for being here. It's awesome teaming up with you guys on this one. We're really, we're happy to have you. We are very happy to be here and GNCC is very excited about partnering with the Curler Outreach Program I've attended some of theirs and uh, I think they always do an excellent job. So without further ado, from the very chilly warm room of the Utica Curling Club, I'm gonna turn this over to Matt Shiner, our, uh, is it chair, head of, whatever you're called, I don't even know what I'm called at GNCC of instruction programs at the GNCC. Thanks, Matt. Well, thank you, MJ. Welcome everybody. I see a few uh, familiar names on uh, the participant list here. So welcome everybody, whether you're familiar or not with me, I'm happy to have you here and we're happy to have a good program for you tonight. I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question, either um, click the raise your hand button or type your question into the chat and one of the moderators will interrupt me. Um, but I am happy to be interrupted. I want this to be as interactive as possible. I'm going to be asking you questions at certain times. So. Feel free at that time, if I ask a question to the general audience, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and, and answer the question or just raise your hand and we can pick on you to, to answer the question. Um, I'm looking at the poll here. It looks like we've got a pretty good split of arena curlers and dedicated curlers, which I love to see at these types of uh, events because we're going to talk about both arena ice and dedicated ice when it comes to strategy. Um, we have quite a few five and unders and uh, quite a few experienced curlers as well, which is fantastic. Um, and it looks like mostly adults, so that's okay. Um, and uh, so yeah, with that being said, uh, the program is gonna be about an hour and a half in total, uh, but we'll go as long as we need to to answer all your questions. So like I said, don't hesitate to click that raise your hand button or type a question into the chat. So let's get started. So uh, special thanks, as Mary Jane said, to the GNCC, which is the region on the Eastern Seaboard, for those of you in other parts of the country that don't know, as well as the Curler Outreach Program. Uh, we, uh, we're happy to uh, present to you Reading the Ice. Okay, so we're gonna first talk about reading ice. So ice reading is learning about what the ice surface is doing at that moment. And one of the important things to note um, is that it changes throughout the game, throughout the week, depending on if you're uh, an arena curler, maybe it's what uh, the Zamboni did that, that time um, from club to club. Um, but when it comes to ice in a dedicated facility in particular, the stones cause the most variability on the sheet. So the sheet itself is relatively consistent and each stone can actually have variability in it. Um, 
And this is why the top players spend so much time considering their stones. And what do we mean when we say considering their stones? Well, actually, some competitive curlers keep rock books, which is actually a, a, a little notepad with uh, little notes to themselves about what each individual stone is doing. One stone may be a cutter, one stone may be a runner, one stone may be heavier, one stone may be lighter. Um, and, and they can get that information through not only watching play, but also experiencing it for themselves. Uh, at the real elite level, there are not that many different sets of stones so that when um, they get used to a certain set, they can know, for example, they would rather match the one and four stones instead of the one and two stones for the lead or something of that nature. Um, who should read the ice? I'm gonna ask that to you guys. Who do you think reads the ice? Don't all speak up at once. Anybody? Kudos to in the chat from to Glenn and Amanda and Kay Bradley, Bradley, everyone. I, I'm gonna say this kit as well as the, the sweepers. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, so it's the entire team's responsibility to read the ice. Um, and every player has a different role. Um, and it's all about communication. Um, so for example, when you're one of the sweepers, uh, you should know which areas of the ice have been worn down and which areas of the ice have maybe have a little bit fresher uh, pebble on it. Um, when you're the skip, you wanna be looking at how much it curls. Does it curl more on this side or that side? Um, and obviously when you're the thrower, it's more about reacting to what you did as the thrower, right? So I was heavy, I was light, I was wide, I was narrow, but everybody should be communicating about ice conditions at all times. Um, and we have a question already. Uh, Amanda wants to know, how are rock books valuable if clubs chain handles slash sheets of the stones every year and even sometimes mid-year? Oh, that's nasty, mid-year. Uh, so the more often a club changes handles and the more often a club uh, sandpapers their rocks, the less effective your rock book is going to help you. Um, but uh, sometimes it's good to know which rocks were switched. So if you have, for example, if you have a note in your rock book about the number four stone and then that stone becomes the number seven stone, um, you can at least take that information and transfer it to the appropriate number if you know which rocks have been switched where. If you don't know, you're gonna to have to kind of start over. Okay, so obviously reading the ice helps you visualize your next shot. So uh, show of hands for those of you who have your video on, how many people use stopwatches to time uh, throws, time the ice? I know I do, right? So. If you know, for example, let's just uh, use hog to hog times. If you know that the ice is going uh, 14 and a half seconds hog to hog for draw weight uh, and your, your skip calls for a guard, you need to throw 15 seconds or, or 15 and a half seconds, right? Um, so knowing what the ice conditions are at that moment can help you prepare for your shot. Okay, so. Let's talk about the ice surface as a piece of topography. And by that, we mean uh, valleys and peaks, or peaks and valleys, excuse me. Um, so there are going to be different peaks and valleys throughout the ice surface. And knowing where those peaks and valleys are is important to reading ice. And there are different kinds of ice conditions. For example, the ice is built up or the ice is worn down. Uh, you may see, for example, towards the end of a game, um, in the area where the sliding path is, so basically on the center line be behind the hog line, uh, you may see that the ice gets more worn down and might even go flat. And you may see things like um, the ice getting uh, what we call fudgy, or you know, it gets really slow in that area. And you oftentimes see drastic curls, almost as if it picked. Um, in that, and that's because the stone traveled over a flat area of ice and doesn't react the same way as when it travels over uh, a pebble. On the outsides, it may be built up. You may have extra pebble there. 
Um, there may be frost out there, depending on uh, what your ice sheds conditions are. Um, so there are a lot of conditions that really affect it. And uh, you, as a team, you need to remember what areas are built up, what areas are worn down, how is that going to affect the weight of the stone or the curl of the stone? Any questions so far while we're going? Okay, so let's talk about some different ice conditions. Peaked ice, we have a little animation. Um, stones on peaked ice, stones curl to the corners, but not necessarily to the middle. This is one condition that we often see uh, when people tend to pebble uh, without swinging their arm enough, and you only get pebble in the middle of the sheet. Um, sometimes there's dished ice. Stones curl, oops, stones curl to the middle, but not necessarily out to the corners. Uh, this you might see if people are over swinging their arm when they're doing the pebbling, or it could be a, the way they're scraping, or it could be the way the Zamboni is running if you're uh, an arena curler, right? Um, so we have to watch out for that. If you, if you happen to notice stones only going to the middle, you might have dished ice. And then for all my arena curlers out there, negative ice, sloped ice, stones curl one way, but not the other. Uh, this is very common on arena ice, particularly on an outside sheet. That's usually because of the way the Zamboni patterns go. Um, and it is very difficult to uh, combat this with uh, ice preparation alone for you arena curlers. But once we have that condition, we have to deal with it. So sometimes you throw a negative handle. Everybody heard the term negative handle before? I'm seeing some head nods, so I'll take that as a yes. Okay, so we've got some other ice conditions. Runs, so what could cause a run? Well, the scraper blade, might be a little uh, digging in on one corner and you get a little bit of a, a run. Um, it could be a, a scraper pattern. There's a, could be a Zamboni run. There's a lot of different things that might cause a run, but once a stone gets stuck into the run or the rut in the ice, it just stays on that line. Or sometimes you see um, the stone will run straight, run straight, run straight. And then as soon as you get over the hump, it just takes off, and that's because it popped out of the run. Uh, Mary Jane, question? We have a question in the chat. I don't see a raise hand button on my laptop. Um, somebody wants to know what a negative handle is. Okay, so negative handle, um, and I'll use left to right and right to left rather than in turn and out turn. Negative handle means the stone is spinning so that you would expect it to travel left to right, but it's actually curling right to left. And the reason for that is the slope of the ice is causing the curl, not the spin of the stone. So that would be negative handle. So interestingly, when we're making a sweep call with negative handle, the sweep call is actually the opposite of conventional wisdom. So if you want the stone to curl more, you actually call sweep with negative handle. And if you want the stone to stay straighter, you call up. So it's a little bit backwards, um, but it does happen a lot on arena ice, or sometimes you have dedicated ice that, uh, for example, in the spring, when you're getting towards the end of the season, the ice might actually heave if you don't have proper insulation under your floor. Um, there was one club here in the GNCC area, Plainfield Curling Club out of New Jersey. Their ice used to heave every year. They finally fixed it, which is fantastic, and the ice has been much better. But when you played at a spiel there in, in April, you knew you had to throw a negative handle because of that heat. All right, should we keep going or is that, is that good for the chat? Hearing nothing, I'll keep going. Okay. So, and then we also have falls. Uh, falls are where the stone goes to the outside without uh, any indication that it should be doing that. Um, oftentimes you see this in a dedicated facility where um, you have the sun beating on a particular wall of the club and that outside sheet sometimes will fall to the wall because there's a temperature gradient on that outside wall. There's not proper insulation on the sides of the sheet. Um, so oftentimes you see that a fall to the wall. Um, on, uh, on arena ice, again, same similar thing. You might have 
uh, a Zamboni track or something that is pulling that stone to the outside. And then we talk about breaks, which is the a rock travels consistently until it hits a certain spot and then it curls like crazy. Um, and there's not much you can do about that. So you're going to pull your hair out. I love these little animations. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ice conditions that we have to deal with. And by and large, the team that finds them the fastest and adjusts to them the fastest is the team that's going to win. Um, so it's important to always be paying attention. You don't just watch the ice on your team's throws. You should watch the ice every throw, including your opponent's throws, um, because there's always information to learn. So let's let's talk about the breakdown. So as the pebble breaks down, and so we're talking about the start of a game, it's the first end, you just put the pebble down, uh, it's gonna be maybe a little bit slower. And then as time goes on, the pebble is gonna wear down a little bit and a little bit from your feet walking on it, from the brush heads brushing it. Um, and, uh, and, and what's gonna happen is it starts to speed up a little bit. So you're gonna start out a little slow and then it speeds up maybe until the third end. It kind of depends on your ice conditions. So it's important to, uh, to take note of that and see how the ice is speeding up. Uh, my club, for whatever reason this year, it's about an end and a half. Um, so it, it starts to get faster and then it will maintain its speed usually for several ends until maybe the seventh or eighth end. Some clubs that might be the sixth end, you don't really know exactly. Um, and then it's gonna start to flatten out and when it flattens out, it tends to slow down. So it's adjusting to those speeds as the game goes on. Um, that's gonna help you to, to uh, make your shots consistently. And that's the key with curling, right? Is being consistent. So when the ice does flatten, it's uh, what we call getting fudgy. Sometimes you might hear that. And it oftentimes happens in the sliding path. And that's because our feet are traveling over that ice more than any other patch of ice on the sheet. And like I said earlier, it results in unpredictable curl. Okay, so let's talk about the run of the stone. This is what I like to call uh, the Nike uh, check mark, right? So stage one, the stone is going to be at its fastest, uh, right, out of your hand. So you let go and the stone is traveling down the sheet. It's going to be going relatively straight. It's gonna be pretty straight for that first area. And then stage two is going to vary from club to club. Um, but it's where you start to see the stone going from a straight path to a curl path. And then it's really in that third stage uh, where you see most of the curl taking place. So I'm going to see if I can do this. So you're sliding out of the hack and you're throwing pretty straight, pretty straight, pretty straight. All right, and then when you get to that third stage, you start to see the curl. And then the stone ends up curling. So you can see, obviously, a very bad drawing because I'm using my computer mouse. But um, most of the curl happens in that last third, right? That's the important part. Um, or you know, somewhere in the range of about six to ten feet in front of the hog line until the stone stops. Uh, that's where most of the curl takes place. Now. A little bit of an aside, let's talk about this for a second. When you are sweeping and you know the stone is relatively light and you know you're going to have to sweep at some point, which, which point, stage one, stage two, or stage three, does it make the most sense to be sweeping? Or maybe all three of them? Any guesses? You can either type in the chat or raise your hand. stage one so that you can uh, keep momentum up a little longer. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Anybody else have any thoughts? For the majority you're going for stage one, got a couple stage twos and one all three. Okay, so let's talk about all three for a second. We're gonna start with that scenario. Uh, the average curler, um, and I'm not talking about the people on TV. I'm talking about people like you and me, <laughs> right? The average curler can be effective 
sweeping for about seven seconds. And after seven seconds, you tend to see a drop off in your effectiveness when sweeping. So uh, the run of the stone from the time the thrower releases to the time the stone stops, typical, uh, you know, good quality ice, you're gonna see about 24 seconds, right? So you have 24 second ice, but only seven seconds are gonna actually be effective. Now, so, so now we can rule out all three just from that, because we know we're gonna get gassed by the end, right? Now, uh, Brandon said stage one because uh, you're keeping the momentum up, but let me give you some food for thought. The stone is going, as soon as the thrower releases the stone, the stone is going at its fastest at that moment. So the impact that your sweeping has on the stone is not as effective as towards the end when the stone is actually slowing down on a percentage basis, right? So it's actually stage three. You as an individual sweeper have the most effect on a draw shot during the last bit at stage three. So something to think about as a sweeper, if you know you're gonna have to go a little bit, it might be worth waiting and then going at the end to save your energy and really push as hard as you can at the end to keep that stone gliding. Now, if you think the stone is gonna hog and you gotta go the whole way, go the whole way. I'm not saying don't, don't sweep, but if you think you need to sweep a little bit, food for thought, think about sweeping towards the end of the shot rather than towards the beginning. It's hard to do as a sweeper because, right, sweepers want to sweep, but uh, food for thought. All right. Any questions before we move on? Okay. So let's talk about tactics. So what should you be doing throughout the game? Who could tell me what the thrower should be doing? Any thoughts? That is dead silent. <laughs> Started with the hard one, right? <laughs> so when you're the thrower, as soon as you release, you actually have more information than anybody else on the sheet about that throw, right? So what you should do immediately, as soon as you release the rock, is communicate, right? I was wide. Think I was heavy, you know. Um, it looks it looks good. Whatever you, whatever you think, right? It's good to let your sweepers know, because for example, if you're wide and you put that stone out in the frost on the built up section of the sheet, they might have to sweep because it's not the weight they thought it was supposed to be. So they're thinking the weight looks good and it's actually light. And the only reason it's light is because you were wide and you're out in the frost now. Right. So immediately, as soon as you let go, communicate. That's that's the thrower's responsibility. For that, Tom wins the QP doll because that's exactly what he said in the chat. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Good job. All right. So how about the sweepers? What do we think the sweepers should do in terms of ice reading? Watch the release of the thrower. Okay, good. So when we say watch the release, what are some things we should be watching? Well, first of all, uh, the momentum, right? Your body's momentum as you walk next to the stone is more important than most anything else for judging weight, even more important than a stopwatch. Um, the other things you can be watching, did they put the right handle on? Is it enough spin in the handle? Uh, you know, is it, is it a relatively light handle or is it a spinner? Maybe it's overspinning. Uh, those kinds of things will affect the stone's travel path and speed. So it's important to notice those things and communicate. Did, uh, did, the, did the thrower push the stone or pull on the stone or lean on the stone if you're maybe a little inexperienced and they don't have a bunch of stability? Um, all those things will affect the stone's uh, travel. So it's important to watch those things as you're walking next to the thrower um, until they release. And then of course, also communication. Tell your skip, I think it's heavy, I think it's light. You don't have to use the, uh, you know, the, the 10 point um, scoring system. It, it's a three, you don't need to say it's a three, you could say it's a guard, 
um, just as effective, right? So communication as a sweeper, also very important. Okay, finally, this is the easy one. What should the skip do in terms of ice reading? You should all be raising your hands now. All right, we've already got my favorite answer. That's from one of my former college curlers, Izzy. Hi, Izzy. Everything. <laughs> everything. That's right. The skip. The skip does everything. Call the line. Listen in line call. Communicate plan B if needed. Line screen. <laughs> Hi, yes, Izzy. All, all of those things, right? Um, the most important thing that I can say as a mentor to all of you, because I, I hope that I am acting in that regard today. Um, if you are a skip and you see your sweepers going really hard at it, do not, under any uncertain terms, run out to help them. <laughs> the skip's job is reading the line. And how can you read the line if you're running out to help people sweep? I understand that they're sweeping hard and I understand that they're tired, but their job is to do the sweeping and your job is to do the line calling. So stay in the house and read the line. That's the most important advice I can give you tonight. I don't know how many times I see curlers running out to help and they'll bump into their teammates, they'll burn the stone, um, they'll, they'll miss the line call. Uh, so they, they, they over sweep and it actually keeps the stone too straight and, and then it's uh, open to be hit. It didn't get behind the guard, whatever the case may be. Your job as the skip primarily is breeding the line. And of course, as we always say, communicating. All right, so last thing, team communication. We talked about this. All four players on the team should be communicating. That's why we do all that yelling, right? There's a reason for it. Um, communication equals making shots. We've got a couple okay. of questions, Matt. Yes, go ahead. Allison, do you want to ask yours directly? You want me to read it? Nope, Allison is I can. on pit stop. Um, I was wondering, Matt, if you have any thoughts about the thrower getting up to help sweep after they're uh, done kind of following through. So in mixed doubles, that can be important. Uh, but in the team game, I say don't do it. Um, so one important thing, and actually, uh, similarly to getting up to help, I love this, the shooters that get up and they follow behind the stone, like three or four feet behind the rock. What are you doing back there? What benefit are you providing the team by standing there behind the rock? None, that, the answer is none. Um, you, what you wanna do is you wanna slide out, you wanna finish your slide, and then from the position where you stop sliding, you wanna watch the line and try to help the skip call line. That's more important than anything else. Um, and, and similarly, I love, the, I love the shooters who they throw the rock, they stand up, they turn around and they walk back to the hack and they put their back to the shot, right? Don't turn around, watch the shot, be a part of the team, be helpful to the team by providing that communication from your perspective as well. Um, it is important to communicate and you can't communicate if you're looking the other direction or, or watching the shot of the team next to you or you know on the sheet next to you or something like that. Matt, we have a, another question or two. Go ahead, um, Megan. Will a skip helping sweep do anything to bring the stone further down the ice? I'm sorry, say that again? <clears throat> will the skip helping sweep do anything to bring the stone further down the ice? No, and I'll tell you why. The further away from the stone you get, the less effective you are at impacting the stone. So if all three of you are sweeping, the skip is at least three feet out in front of the rock. And there are um, thermal scans of ice that can show when you're three feet out past the rock, you have basically negligible zero effect on the, uh, the pebble at that point. So um, um, unless you're going in and replacing one of the other sweepers, if a certain sweeper is completely gassed and they're not helping in any way, and the skip runs out to replace them, then you'll have some impact. I, I still don't think it's worth it because you're not watching the line. Um, but uh, if all three of you are sweeping, that third person that's all the way out in front is basically having zero impact on the rock. And, and science has proven that. It's not just my opinion. 
got one more comment uh, right. from Amanda saying, watch your own shots. You know the ice for when you are sweeping. That's right. You can always learn something on every shot, whether it's your shot, your opponent's shot. Um, at all times, we should be watching the stones and paying attention and concentrating and adding that to the memory bank because two ends from now, that may come back to help you or haunt you if you didn't watch. All right, so moving on. So during the shot, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so I'll blow through this kind of quickly. Uh, so the thrower, you're gonna watch your stone the full length of the ice. You're going to note the rate of curl early, middle and late, right? So we know late, it's gonna curl the most. Uh, sweepers, you should be watching your opponent's stones. Um, standing at the hog line, slip in behind your opponent and watch the path of the stone. So this is what we like to call getting on TV, right? When, uh, when, they, when they show games on TV, right? They're always showing the perspective of down the sheet towards the, the thrower and the thrower is sliding towards you. As they slide past the hog line and you slip in behind them, you get on TV again. So everybody gets to see your beautiful faces. Uh, so get on TV, get in behind that thrower and watch the, the path of the stone. Learn something from your opponent's stones too. Okay, during the shot, you're gonna hold the broom on the T line, okay? So this is important. I often see a lot of times curlers will call a guard and then stand out in front of the house with the broom. And what you're actually doing is you're changing the line of delivery when you do that. The important thing about the T line is there are distinct measurements and hopefully I can do the pen thing again here. So from the center line, and I'm really terrible at drawing with my mouse, from the center line to the edge of the forefoot, that's two feet, right? From the edge of the forefoot to the edge of the eight foot, that's two feet. From the edge of the eight foot to the edge of the 12 foot, that's another two feet. So if you wanna go uh, three feet of curl and you're trying to curl to the button, you put your broom right there because that is three feet, right? If it's curling five feet and you wanna curl to the button, you can put your broom there because you know that is five feet. If you're out here holding the broom, how many feet away are you from the center line? No idea. There's no way to measure it. The only place you have a distinct measurement is on the T line. So be consistent, put your broom in the same place every time. Um, the one caveat to that I will say is um, during hits, right? So for hits, you wanna be next to the stone that you're hitting. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Why we should be on the T-line for every shot except the hit? Okay, good. Uh, using the T-line as a memory aid, like we said, uh, oftentimes I will uh, mentor new skips. And the first question I ask them mid game is, how many feet is it curling right now? If they don't know the answer, they haven't been paying attention, right? Because we know. Typical ice, you might see four feet or five feet of curl. Um, on arena ice, you might see six feet of negative curl. You don't know, but the, the point is, the only way to measure it is from that T line. You also wanna watch the thrower's release. This is really important for you college curlers. Oftentimes, uh, I'm being told by Mary Jane that um, the skip of a college team is somebody who possibly played as a junior and the other three players on the team are relatively new to curling. They've only curled for a year or two, something like that. that. That's oftentimes the makeup of a college team, right? So if you're the skip and you know that your thrower's release is not consistent, you have to watch that release. If they slide wide and then push it narrow, it changes the line of delivery and that will change the way that it curls, right? So it's important to watch that. Here's a little training tip for you. Remain behind the T-line and point your broom at the rock as it travels towards you, okay? And then move the broom head across the ice as the stone curls towards you. So in other words, you wanna stand, now we're talking about from being behind the T-line, watching the stone coming at you. You wanna stand where you think the stone is going to end up. And if the stone is coming towards your body faster than you expect, it's over curling and you should sweep for line. If the stone is not coming towards your body as quickly as you expected, it's hanging out and you might wanna call up 
or uh, potentially change the way that you're sweeping in terms of uh, if you use directional sweeping or not, right? So use your body as the judging aid. Any questions so far? We've got one, I can answer it online, but I think I'll let you do it. And that's, what if it's hard to see the broom on the tee due to clutter in the house? Um, so for example, um, this rock over, uh, can you see my mouse or no? I'll use the pen. Yes, we can see your mouse. This rock is in the way because your broom is here, right? That's what you're saying? Like, what if, what if they don't, um, the, the thrower has trouble seeing it? Um, so one thing you can do is rather than just pointing your broom head, you can stand the broom up vertically, completely straight up and down and use the shaft of the broom as the target rather than just the broom head on an angle, sort of the way this skip is holding it. Um, another option is from the T-line, once you've set the line of delivery, you can walk along the line of delivery to get in front of the stone that has been cluttered. So we know, right, that the line of delivery here, oh, I'm so bad at drawing. The line of delivery is not straight out like this, right? We're, and I'm going to exaggerate. It's towards the hack that they're throwing from, right? So that line is obviously exaggerated. It's more like here, right? So you can walk along that line of delivery and then put your broom head in front of that rock if you need to. But you have to start back here at this point. Does that make sense? We have another question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, from Ryan, when you follow the rock with your broom, how much should you anticipate where the shot might end up? That's completely a judgment thing. So um, if your if your ice you believe if your ice is say curling four feet, uh, stand four feet over. If you think the ice is curling three feet, stand three feet over. Um, you're not going to know that necessarily right away if it's your first time playing there or if it's arena ice and you haven't seen you know, the effects of the Zamboni that particular day. Um, but it's, it's a judgment thing. You just have to get used to it. All right, moving along. So communication, learn to feel your release. Did you push? Did you pull? Um, did you start the stone? Does everybody know what starting the stone means? That's kind of a jargon term. So starting the stone um, means uh, when you put the handle on, you sort of pushed it towards the direction that it's supposed to be curling in. Um, and so it ends up being narrow usually. Um, did you flare the stone? So you sort of pushed it with your hand out off of the line of delivery and that tends to be wide. Um, if yes, communicate that. Tell your skip, tell your sweepers. Um, if you don't communicate, they're gonna misread the ice, right? If you, if you feel that you did something with your hands to affect the way the stone is going to curl, the only person that's gonna know that is you, all right? Sweepers, it's your responsibility to focus on the speed or the weight of the stone. Uh, to communicate an abnormal release. We talked about that earlier. Is it a relatively light handle? Is it a spinner? Um, you should not be calling line if you're sweeping. As, as somebody who's standing over the rock, it's hardest for you to see the line. Um, watch the thrower's release. Uh, learn speed and how the stone will travel on its line. So what we're talking about there is um, you know, ice conditions, were we in, are we in the fast lane? Are we in the frosty area? Things like that. And it should also make you think about your own release. Uh, if you're a stopwatch person, I used a hog to hog split before, I'll use a back to hog split this time. You know that you timed your teammate at 375 and you wanna throw a similar shot, so you need to throw a 375. And what does that feel like? You don't know what a 375 feels like. It's not going to help you. So it's good to ask your teammates, what did you time me at? I ask that question a lot of my teammates. Okay, so that was reading the ice. While we are um, switching, uh, 
slides here. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yes, I want to run away to wherever your screensaver is. I have a question. You talked about standing where you want the stone to end up and then using your broom handle as the target point. Is that like a good thing to do all the time or is that just for you as a skip learning kind of how things are going to go? I would say the standing part you should use all the time and the moving the broom head part as, as a practice thing. All right, good question, David, thank you. All right, so let's move on to strategy. So now, we, now that we know how to read the ice, um, how do we impart that onto our gameplay? So curling, the only thing you're winning is a hernia. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about strategy versus tactics. Who can tell me the difference between strategy and tactics? Strategy would be kind of the overall approach to the game, and tactics would be how you execute said strategy. Good answer, Ryan. Thank you very much. So, sort of uh, reiterating what Ryan just said, strategy is the plan, and tactics is how you execute that plan. Okay, and we're going to talk about both today. So, let's talk about end objectives for a basic strategy. So the basic strategy is when you have the hammer, you want to take two. When you don't have the hammer, you want to hold them to one. Now, this is very dissimilar to any other sport that we play in America, right? Every sport in America, you want to score all the time, and you want your opponent to not score all the time, right? In football, touchdowns. In soccer, goals. In baseball, runs. You're trying to score as many as you can. And you're trying to make sure your opponent scores zero, right? But in curling, that's not actually the case. And it's because of the distinct advantage that we have with the hammer that this is the case. So when you do not have the hammer, you are not necessarily trying to score, but rather you are trying to prevent the opponent from scoring a lot. But you want them to score so that you get the hammer back. And here's the reason why. So you're the red team. If you follow your objective, which is to score two with the hammer and hold them to one without the hammer, in a typical eight end game, you are going to win eight to four every time. Does everybody see that? Does that make sense to everyone? So you don't need to score every end to win the game. You just need to make sure that you take advantage of having the hammer when you have it, and you make sure that your opponent can't take advantage of having the hammer when you don't have it. Make sense? Okay. So you don't have a worksheet, but we're gonna complete this worksheet together. So with the hammer, what is our objective? When we have the hammer, what is our main objective? To score two or more points. To score two, thank you, Jasmine. Really good, right? What would be acceptable? Not ideal, but acceptable. Score one. Scoring none, a blank. The hammer. Score one, who said blank? blank? A blank. One. Who was that, who said blank? Several Rusty. people on the chat too. Several people, all right. Yes, exactly. Blanking is acceptable, taking one is acceptable. Sometimes your opponent prevents you from scoring two, right? That is completely acceptable. What would be unacceptable? A steal. A steal, exactly. Giving up one or more. And then what would be a bonus? Score three. Right. Taking more than two. Thank you. Good job. That was Jay. Good job, yep. Jay. Okay. Now, we don't Everybody's have Everybody's nailing this on the chat, too, just so you know. Fantastic. Thank you, chatters. Um, what would be the objective without the hammer? We just said it. Hold them to one. 
Forcing them to one, correct. And what would be acceptable? Not ideal, but okay. Blank. Let's talk about blank for a second. Actually, I'm gonna reserve that till later. Hold, hold that thought, Jay. Anybody else, what would be acceptable? Two. Right, giving up two. Several right? people are saying that in chat also. Good, good job chatters, right? So it's not ideal, um, but giving them two is not the end of the world. What would be unacceptable? Good numbers. <laughs> I love more it. Than two. Give up more than two. More than two, right. Thank you, William. Good job. And now let's talk about the bonus. Without the hammer, what's the bonus? Steel. A steel, exactly. So now, Jay, I want to go back to your comment. What do you not see in the without the hammer column? I see Jay's blank. Lips I don't see blank. A blank, right. So why is a blank not in the column for without the hammer? You don't have control over it, really. Exactly. You don't yeah. get to decide if you blank or not when you don't have the hammer, right? The hammer team decides. If there are no stones in the house and it's the hammer shot, they can draw in if they want to, right? So when you don't have the hammer in terms of strategy, blank is not an option for you. Okay, so let's talk about dividing the sheet into thirds. We have uh, the inner third and the outer thirds, right? So the inside and the outsides. Okay, and we're going to talk about those thirds quite a bit. So when you're playing with the hammer, you want to direct play to the outer thirds, and you want to move or remove opponent's rocks from the inner thirds. I love these animations. Right, that makes sense. So with the hammer, we're trying to keep that middle third as empty as possible for as long as possible throughout the end. Who can tell me why? So that you have a clear draw with your skip right. spine stone. Very good, Jasmine, thank you. So when you have the hammer, you need to be able to draw that button or at least draw the forefoot um, on command. And you can't do that with a ton of uh, rocks in the middle third, right? So we always have to give our skip that ability to draw the, to the bit middle there. So we have this thing that we call the control zone and you want to own the control zone. With the hammer, we own the control zone by keeping it empty. So we're moving our opponent's rocks behind the T-line or hitting them out or pushing them to the outside, right? Um, so you'll notice the control zone for a hammer team is from about a middle guard, a two guard, down to the T-line from one four-foot string to the other. That is our control zone, right? That's for the hammer team. Now, let's talk about offensive versus defensive. Um, who can tell me what offensive is and what defensive is? Offensive is generally more rocks in play. Defensive is to try and keep the rocks out of play. Very good, Ryan. And you did not fall for my trap, right? Oftentimes, most people think offensive is hitting, and it's actually the opposite. Defensive is hitting, and offensive is messing it up. Right, so when you have the hammer, we're playing to the top of the outer thirds. That's those red zones there. And the tactics that we're using are corner guards, drawing behind the guards, and we're limiting the amount of hitting. That's offensive strategy. Yellow team is struggling in this end. <laughs> So here's another point that I want to make. When 
you put up a guard and then you don't use it throughout the end. What did you do? Ultimately, you wasted a rock, right? If you put up a guard and you don't use it, you've wasted a rock. You only get eight rocks in an end. So every single one of them is important. So uh, we see here in this animation that the red team put up two corner guards, one on each side, but they never actually went behind the red that's on the right hand side of the sheet. So instead of doing two corner guards, one on the left, one on the right, maybe consider doing two corner guards, both on the same side, one high and one low. Just a tactic to, to think about. Food for thought. We'll get to that a little bit more if we have time for the intermediate strategy. Okay, defensive strategy. Yeah, go ahead, Mary Jane. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for attending. I have to go off to play now. And hopefully my skip will follow all these wonderful suggestions that Matt has given us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right, for participating. Take care, everyone. Um, so who's going to be monitoring the chat? That's me. Don't worry. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so let's talk about defensive strategy, right? So now we're talking about keeping it clean. With the hammer, you're playing tighter. Notice how the zones go further down into the sheet. We're going down to the T line. And also we're not as high in the guard zone, right? The, the zone has shrunk a little bit. Um, so you're playing into the rings and your tactics include fewer guards in play, or if you do have guards, they should be tight to the house and play is into the house and there's more hitting. So that's the difference between offensive and defensive with the hammer. Okay, now we're talking about without the hammer. Okay, so you're going to direct play to the inner thirds now. You're going to control the inner third by having your rocks in play in the inner third and when you're removing opponent's rocks, you're trying to roll towards the middle. So evidently only one color is playing this end. There are no yellow rocks in play. <laughs> like I said, I love these animations, but the point is we're playing to the middle. Okay, now let's talk about the control zone when you don't have the hammer. So we're talking about in, in that same zone, right, four foot to four foot from the T line up to about a middle guard. When you do not have the hammer, you're trying to play into the control zone as opposed to keeping the control zone empty. When you're hitting, you're trying to roll into that control zone. Uh, Jasmine, I think you answered the question before. Why do we want to play into the control zone when we don't have the hammer? that we gunk it up for the team that does have the hammer on their last shot. Right. So when the hammer team wants that open so that they can make that draw with that hammer shot, we're trying to junk up that area so that they don't have that draw with that hammer shot. Very good, Jasmine. Thank you. So no hammer, offensive strategy. We're messing it up, right? Offensive, lots of guards in play, lots of rocks in play. So you're playing into that inner third. You're utilizing center sentry guards, um, you're drawing behind the guards, and hitting is limited. Uh, defensive, we're trying to keep it clean, right? Same as before, but now without the hammer, you play into the house, see how shrunken down that zone is now, um, and the tactic is fewer guards. Again, same as before, if you do have a guard, it's tight to the house, play is into the house, there's more hitting. Okay, so we're gonna play an end. Remember, the hammer has outer thirds. Without the hammer, you have the inner third. The control zone is that red zone in the middle there. Offensive is to the outside with the hammer or to the middle third without the hammer. Defensive is, again, to the outside with the hammer, to the middle third without, but shrunken down, less guards in play. Okay, so we're going to play an end. Who's ready? Okay, we're going to use the pen feature on uh, the PowerPoint here, so it may get a little ugly, but 
So we're going to start with an offensive end with the hammer. Okay, so what are we going to start? Uh, well, you you were the team with the hammer, so I'm going to go and I'm going to throw a center guard. All right. So now you are the hammer team. What are you going to throw? And I'll use uh, I don't know. Yellow might be hard to see. I'll use green. What are you going to throw? Offensive strategy with the hammer. We're getting corner guard. We got a suggestion for a draw. Mostly corner, though. Mostly corner guard. So probably there, right? And then I'm going to be playing aggressive. So I'm going to throw a second guard. Now, what are you going to do? Ryan says double corner guard. Double Same corner. Side. So Ryan, you want there? Um, we have a suggestion for a, a draw in. Somebody wants to draw in. That might be there. Oh, that green is hard to see on the blue. Sorry. Both are good options, right? Staying to one side. Also, another option is to put the corner guard on the other side, right? I would say all three are successful options. Okay. Turn your pen off. Now, we're going to play a defensive end with the hammer. So again, I'm going to throw my center guard. Now you are playing defensive. What are you going to do? We have a draw to the button. We have a tick, couple of ticks. Ticks are very difficult for relatively new curlers. So let's avoid the tick just based on the ability to make our shot. <laughs> uh, draw into the house again. Um, another corner That's guard right. suggestion. I'm trying to make it so that you can see it. So I like, I like to draw into the house over on the wing. Somebody mentioned draw to the button, right? Is that a defensive shot, you think? Behind Red's guard? That's very offensive. That's very offensive, I agree. So drawing over here to the side, I think would be the more defensive shot. Okay. Uh, race. Now, without the hammer, if time permits, time does permit. So without the hammer, uh, I played pretty offensively. So you're gonna play defensively. So without the hammer, defensively. Anything in the chat? Yeah, we got a uh, tight center guard. This suggests even biting, like a top of the house move. One of these kind of deals. Yeah, That's looks about bad. right. That's not bad. What else? Any other options? What's the move, team? I don't hate that. Right, top four, even top eight, anywhere, anywhere from here to here. These two are good options. Um, Oops, sorry, sorry. Okay, so let's let's split the difference and do top eight. Okay, so you did that. And now I'm gonna I'm gonna um, take the bait. I'm gonna hit and I'm gonna roll to there. So I'm gonna end up like that. Now, what are you gonna do? Hit and roll, hit and roll. Okay. Yep, so lots of hit and rolls. We're hitting. 
and we're rolling to there, right? Make sense? And now you've set up a nice defensive end just like you wanted because I took your bait. <laughs> All right, so that's really quick um, basic strategy. And so now we're going to move on to the intermediate strategy. So give me one second to switch my slides here. Any questions while we're switching slides? Doesn't look like it, Matt. They're ready. Okay, good. All right, let's do intermediate strategy and tactics. Okay, so this is a little bit of review from what we just did. So I'm gonna go quickly. Strategy is the plan. Tactics are how you execute, yeah? Okay, let's talk about decision-making. And we're gonna create the funnel, okay? So we're gonna start with basic style, which is a team's specific approach to shot selection. And then we're gonna talk about a game plan and then the end goal. So basic style, okay? We talked about this already. So teams shot making decisions are determined by, oops, you didn't see that. What are they determined by? Some of you should have seen it. <laughs> ability, ability, we got. Ability, ability, right? So your ability. So before we were talking about the tick shot and I said, let's not call the tick because um, by and large, it's a very difficult shot to make well and do it consistently. So let's avoid it, right? I, I'm expecting that our team does not have the ability to make the tick shot consistently, right? So that's a, that's a decision that affects our strategy. Um, the other item that I would say is the resilience for a wide range of game situations. And by that, I mean, if you tend to be an offensive strategy and it's not working out and you have to switch to defensive or vice versa, your, your, your uh, resilience towards making that change and shifting your um, type of strategy um, will affect how you make shot calls. Okay, so we have the team's philosophy, right? Um, risk versus reward is, uh, so yeah, there it is. Risk versus reward is important. Are you willing to take risks to get that big reward? Um, if you're not willing to take the risk, call the hit. <laughs> so there are three different types of styles. We talked about two of them already, offensive and defensive. Who can tell me what the third one is? Any guesses? Ryan says mixed. Yeah, Combo. mixed. Mixed is a good way of saying it. The term we have in the PowerPoint here is balanced, right? So sometimes offensive, sometimes defensive. I will say I tend to play kind of a balanced strategy. When I have the hammer, I tend to be offensive. When I don't have the hammer, I tend to be defensive. Um, that's just the way my style has evolved over the years. Okay, so offensive versus defensive. Again, you guys don't have the worksheets, so we're gonna do this together. Um, so what are some terms that are good terms for offensive first? So. Things like aggressive, create scoring, risky, attack, finesse. Why finesse? Any thoughts on that? No, seeing none. So finesse because when you're playing offensive, and you're trying to draw behind that guard, if you don't bury perfectly behind the guard, your opponent can hit you out. So it's a little bit of risky, right? So finesse and risk go together. And the last one here, quickly understanding ice conditions. So this is important, okay? If you're going to play offensive first, you really need to pick up on the ice conditions quickly because if you don't and you start missing shots, you're gonna give up a big end. <laughs> 
right? If you're trying to throw those finesse type shots and you miss, it really hurts you. And that's the risky part of it. So if you're good at understanding ice conditions quickly or picking up on quick ice conditions later in the game, uh, or pick up on changing ice conditions, I should say, later in the game, offensive first might be a style for you. Defensive first, some of the words we think of. Conservative, patient for chances, that's a good one. Safe, opportunistic, why opportunistic? People made mistakes, and so you can right. capitalize on them. Perfect, Ryan. Thank you. Um, you have to capitalize when your opponent makes a mistake, right? That's how you're going to score big ends on a defensive strategy. Simple, right? Keeps the game simple. And you have time to read the ice and wait because you're not in that first end. You're not trying to make that perfect draw. You're just pushing through that heavy uh, pebble. Okay? And Again, we said before, tactics are how you execute. So offensive tactics. Um, actually, you guys can tell me some of these. What do you guys think? I gave you the first one, rocks in play. What are some other tactics for offensive strategy? Ryan says good weight, guards. Guards, yep. What else? What are some other offensive tactics? Guards are good. Box and play. What else? How about freezes? Oh, yep. There it is. Freezes, Ryan says. Ryan's on top of his game. Today. He's got it. <laughs> uh, some others. Come around draws. Right, Drawing around the guard. Drawing through a port. Tap backs. Tapbacks are finesse shots, right? They're not hits. Uh, oftentimes you see uh, younger curlers, and younger I mean not by age, but by curling experience. You often see younger curlers throwing tapbacks as if they're hits, and they end up pushing the stone through the house or only catching the corner because they threw too hard and didn't curl enough, right? A tapback is a draw that just happens to have a stone in the way. Uh, so that tapback is a finesse shot. We said guards, and then uh, the last one is corner freezes. All right, so now defensive first. What are some tactics for defensive first? Takeouts. Yes, takeouts for sure. Peels. Peels, yep, which is a takeout. Few rocks in play. Fewer rocks in play, right. Um, so, ooh, where's my space bar? There we go. Hang it open. Peels, we said that. Hit and roll, that's a particular type of takeout. A run through or a run back, sometimes it's called, right? Where you're, you're hitting a higher stone back into another stone for a takeout. Playing into the rings, right, is a tactic we use for defensive first. And then, of course, we said hits, right? Any questions about this uh, worksheet here that we filled out together? All right, good. Let's keep going. So we kind of talked about this in the, in the basic strategy, so we'll go quickly. Offensive is more aggressive, potentially risky. Uh, you have a large number of rocks in play to maximize your scoring, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I ruined the animation there, but you get the point. Defensive, basic style, fewer rocks in play. We're minimizing our opponent's scoring. We're able to switch when offense is required, and that's the opportunistic that we talked about earlier, right? Makes sense so far? So here's the animation. We go into the house. Hit, roll. Two reds in a row. <laughs> Hit, roll. Okay. Okay, so offensive tactics. We talked about this a little bit already. Here's that same uh, picture from before. So finesse shots. We're talking about draws, catbacks, freezes. That tends to be offensive. Take out game only when you have a big lead. So you play offensive early, you get out to an early lead. 
Then you switch to defensive to protect the lead by minimizing your opponent's scoring. If you go up for nothing uh, and then uh, you trade ones the rest of the game, you're going to win by four, right? So you must be good at, who remembers what we must be good at for offensive tactics? Draws, precision shots, reading the ice, all suggestions, weight. Reading the ice, really good. Line calling, which is part of reading the ice. Weight judgment, whoever said that, good, really good job. Okay, defensive tactics, same thing, right? We're trying to control or limit our opponent's scoring. You need to be patient. That's part of that opportunistic that we've talked about earlier, right? Uh, wait for those opportunities. Take those chances when, uh, when you have the opportunity to. Okay, and we're going to play into the rings and more of a hit game. Now, if you're playing defensive and your opponent Uh oh, Matt, we can't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, that was weird. weird. I don't know what, what happened there. Sorry. Um, I don't know where I left off, so let me just finish the thought. Uh, when you're playing defensive and your opponent gets out to Uh oh, Matt, you're cutting out again. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Third time is a charm. So your opponent gets out to a big lead. You're playing defensive. You have to switch it up to offensive. You have to be more risky and take chances because it's the only way you're going to catch back up. So oftentimes you see teams will switch it up halfway through the game to try to catch up. And sometimes the risk does not pay off and you lose nine to two, <laughs> right? Sometimes that happens. That happened to me last night in my game. <laughs> Okay, balanced. Uh, opportunistic is important. It's important to be aggressive when you need to be. Uh, it's important to be patient when you need to be. So it's a balance between that patience and that aggression, right? Risk versus reward. Um, this, Like I said, this is somewhat how I play. I play aggressive with the hammer, defensive without the hammer, and take chances when the score dictates. We went down last night. And we had to get more aggressive as the game went on in order to catch up. And uh, it didn't work out. And we lost nine to two. <laughs> it happens. But you need to get riskier when you get down early. OK, so let's talk about now the game plan. So we first, we first did basic style. Now we're narrowing it down to specifically the game plan. So. The game plan is developed to maximize winning. So we're going to fill our funnel with some useful information. Our opposition, is it a friend that you've played against a number of times? Is it uh, you're at a bond spiel and it's brand new people, but you watched their game uh, earlier in the day, all right? What do you know about your opposition? Do they like to hit? Then play a draw game. Do they like to draw? Then play a hit game, right? Uh, what are the playing conditions? If the ice is really slow, a hit game will benefit you. Um, if the ice is really fast, a draw game may benefit you. Um, if it's really swingy, uh, a draw game may benefit you because it's harder to make precision hits and get those rolls that you need, things of that nature. Um, and then what is your team's basic style? Do you like to be a hitting team? Do you like to be an, an offensive team? Um, it's perfectly acceptable to play not even acceptable, it's encouraged to play to your strengths, right? And that's how we determine our game plan. So, I have a question about that, yes. what you're saying. Oh, sorry, one second, I have echo in here. 
Um, what I'm trying to, ex my question, I guess, is which may be too hypothetical, but um, what would you say is the balance between playing to your team's strengths versus also modifying um, your strat like your usual strategy in order to sort of capitalize on your opponent's weaknesses? For example, if you know your team is not the strongest at hits, and so you want to play more um, of a guarded game, or of I always get them confused which play is which defensive versus offensive. Um, but you usually play with more guards and more stones in play. But you know that because of how the other team plays, you should play the opposite. Like, how, you know, what's sort of the give and take, I guess, of staying true to what you know, even if it may be a harder fought game because of the opponents versus um, changing your style because of how you know the opponent may have weaknesses. I don't know if that was clearly yeah. stated. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good question, Isabella. Thank you. Um, so what I would say is if playing to your opposition's weaknesses makes your team weaker, it's not worth it, right? You want to play to your strengths more than you want to um, hurt your team's strengths by playing to their weaknesses, if that makes sense. So um, by and large, if you're, if you're comfortable playing both offensive and defensive, uh, then it's okay to play to your opposition's weaknesses. Um, but you don't want to do it to your own detriment. A great example of that is if you know that their lead can't hit, you can play into the house because you can expect your opposing skip to either not call the hit or call it and expect them to miss. But then knowing that you are a draw team, have your second throw guards, right? And protect the stones that your lead put into the house. So you're, you're playing to the the leads weakness of your opposition while still staying true to your strengths as a team does that make sense isabella yes thank you yes. you're very welcome okay so we talked about the opposition we kind of uh, talked about this performance from previous games you may be able to check statistics if it's a, a high-end competition um, you can compare strengths and weaknesses. Um, are they better at hits? Are they offensive or defensive? We kind of talked about all of this, right? Playing conditions. Conditions can and will affect the types of shots selected. Cane ice is ice that's really swingy, right? It will make it easier to play finesse shots and harder to play hits. Heavy straight ice, it'll be easy. Oh, you're out again, Matt. Ooh, cutting, cutting in and out a little bit. Is it is it a connection thing? You think? Uh, you know, it keeps saying it keeps switching my microphone on me automatically somehow. I'm not sure why. Huh. I apologize. No problem. We got we you back. Good, we had a good hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden... Okay, so that's how we come up with the game plan. And now let's talk about end goals. So we talked about this before, we did this worksheet, so I'm gonna blow through this quickly, right? With the hammer, the objective is to take two. It's acceptable to take a blank or one. It's unacceptable to give up a steal, and the bonus is more than two. Without the hammer, it is the objective to force them to one. It is acceptable to give up two. It is unacceptable to give up more than two, and it is the bonus to steal one or more. Obviously, we said this before, without the hammer, you don't get to decide if you blank or not. Okay, so again, the refresher, with the hammer, you're playing to the outer thirds. Without the hammer, you're playing to the inner third. You wanna control the control zone. With the hammer, that means keeping it open. Without the hammer, that means clogging it up. Offensive, you're putting guards in play, so our um, zone is a little larger. Defensive, you're playing into the house, so our zone is a little smaller. We went over all of this before, so that's why I went quickly. Any questions before we move on? Seeing none, let's go. Okay, so let's talk about behind the T-line. Opponents rocks behind the T-line are your friends because they become catchers. And there we go, we smile. <laughs> Does that make sense? I went through that quickly, but behind the T-line is 
uh, not something that you want to strive for unless you have a specific reason, such as trying to suck the stone in behind a guard or something like that later on in an end. But when you're talking early in the setup of the end, you do not want stones behind the T-line. Keep them as high as you can uh, when it comes to being in the house. Okay, so this is the situation for all of the scenarios we're going to go through. You are playing at a new club, the Hackers Curling Club. The ice curls three feet inside and out, so it's not arena ice. And your team is equally good at hits and draws. So we are a balanced team. So this speaks right to Isabella's question. Your team curls 75%, which is pretty good. And it is similar to your opponent. So they also curl 75%. So for all the scenarios we're going to go through, we're, we're assuming all of these things, OK? So scenario number one, it is the first end. You have hammer, so you are the red team. It is unfamiliar playing conditions because it's the first game of the bond spiel. And your basic style is similar to your opponent. OK, so first end, you have hammer. So uh, you're red. I'm sorry. Let me switch the color here. So. They throw a center guard, and now you have the hammer. So what are you going to throw? Corner guard. Corner guard. Evidently, the red stones are larger than the green stones. <laughs> right? Makes sense. That's a great, great option. Great, great uh, tactic there. Okay, scenario number two. It is the eighth and last end. You have the hammer, you are red, you're down three. So you have to score three to tie, four to win, right? And it is the first vice's rock. So the hammer team's first vice rock. So you are red. What would you do here? You have to score three. I would draw, like do a heavy draw to the yellow that's on the forefoot. So kind of tap it back and hope to stick around there. Maybe even if you're lucky, uh, sort of roll behind your other red. And then the yellow goes maybe to there, right? Is that what you're saying? I'm assuming there was another suggestion in chat to draw around the yellow that's in the, the top 12. So, all right. Keep it to the side. So you're saying draw to there. Yes? I believe so, yeah. Yep, Ryan says yep. I'm saying yes. Okay, so that's another option. What else? Any other any other thoughts? Could you freeze down to that yellow that's at the T-line? Freeze the yellow. So that, Jasmine, yes? Yeah. Okay, so we've got three choices, right? Let's talk about each one. And I'm gonna start the conversation with, you have to be very aggressive, right? Because you need to score three. It's the last end, you have no choice, score three or lose, right? So being aggressive, means what rocks in play right what else freezes come arounds freezes come arounds not hitting right so to isabella's uh option right if we're rolling over to open and pushing that yellow back there it makes it easy for the yellow team to hit this rock. So we probably don't want to do that because we're allowing them to hit. Now uh, to, I think it was Ryan's option over here. That's pretty good for now, 
What would yellow do if we did that? Ryan, right? They would either, they would probably tap out the red that's in the eight foot to reduce counters. Yeah, I mean, there's a guard here, so they might try to come down and tap that just a little bit and end up there, right? They might try that. Or another option is they might draw over to here to make it harder for you to get all the yellows out. And I tried to make that as flat as possible, really there. Right. If I was yellow, that's probably what I would do to make sure that you couldn't score. So while that does put rocks in play, it does make it pretty difficult to score three. Right? You always got to think about what your opponent will do next. Now, Jasmine said freeze. Of the three choices that we made, I like that one the best, and I'll tell you why. It's very difficult for yellow to hit that rock out. It's very difficult for yellow to put another rock in play that prevents you from putting a stone in scoring position next, right? If we put that rock there, what is yellow going to do? Any thoughts? What what yellow I would be? Guard it, but um, they depending on where your freeze ends up, either they're sitting one or you're sitting one, but you're not getting the three that you need. Uh, yeah, so probably not a guard, but yes, putting their stone somewhere that prevents you from scoring. So they might try to freeze on top of that, or um, they might try to. Sorry, they might try to hit and get some separation. So they're gonna lose the yellow and the red's probably gonna go to there, right? So they're gonna try to open it up, but then at that point, red is sitting too, right? Cause the shooter, the shooter most likely rolls out, yeah? With a heavy hit. So red is sitting too. If, if yellow chooses that, if they choose the freeze, red has some options. Although difficult, right? I mean, we're trying to score three. It's going to be hard no matter what we do. But red has some options. So of the three options that we talked about, I like the freeze. I like Jasmine's call in this particular instance. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, we know a perfect freeze is probably the hardest shot in curling to make consistently, right? So we're being aggressive. We're taking chances. But we're doing that because we have no choice. It's the last end and we need to score three, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? Any other options that came up in your mind while we were talking? Uh, Isabella did put one in the chat um, suggesting just kind of hitting nose or maybe even a little bit from our perspective left of nose on that yellow that's in the forefoot. Uh, with a little bit heavier than draw weight so that maybe you can roll behind that red a touch and be sitting hopefully two. Oh, I've got green. Hold on. Let me switch to red. So you're saying kind of a heavy draw that gets as far over as you can without crashing the other red and tucking in back here and pushing the yellow maybe to there. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Also a very low percentage and by that i mean difficult to make shot so that versus the freeze um you know six and one half dozen the other but yeah it's certainly an option but again same thing as we said we're being aggressive we're trying to make difficult shots because we have no choice because the scoreboard is dictating for us make sense everyone Okay, scenario number three. Again, it is the last end. You are now yellow. You do not have the hammer, but you are up. Oh, wait, you are red still, I'm sorry. You are red, you do not have the hammer. You are up three, it's six to three, last end. Um, and it is the lead's second stone. So red threw into the top four, yellow through the corner guard. Now what is red going to do? That's the question. Uh, 
A guard. Center guard. Center guard. So yes, there. Suggestions. Yep. That's suggestion one. What else? Ryan says a throw through. Okay, that's one option. And let's do one more. Uh, Isabella suggests drawing behind that yellow guard on the side. Ryan also suggests putting it on top of the shot rock. Jasmine, do you have one? I was going to say an even tighter guard, like hiding the 12 foot. All right, we're going to we're going to lump all three of those together and we're going to call that drawing into the house as an option, right? OK, so. Option one was center guard, right? So let's talk about that. We don't have the hammer but we're up by three and it's the last end. So all we have to do is make sure that our opponent scores two or less and we win the game, right? So for our opponent to score more than two, what is it that they want? They're getting aggressive, right? They're getting offensive, but offensive aggressive meaning the same thing, right? Jack so, says they want access to the house, rocks in play. They want rocks in play. So by putting a guard up, we're giving our opponent what they want. Um, I don't recall who it was that suggested this. Um, was it Christy? For the center guard, a couple of people. Isabel, Isabella suggested it. Oh, she actually, she suggested the tight center guard. But do we see why this center guard is probably not the best option? Everybody understands that? Okay, option number two, Ryan, my man, through, right? Now, if you were gonna throw through, wouldn't you have done that with the first rock? <laughs> so the fact that we played one into the house says we're probably not playing that tactic necessarily. But if it was the lead's first rock, I would agree with you, Ryan. Throwing through the house is not a bad option. Up three or more. Um, if you're up two with the five rock rule now, uh, I definitely would not throw through. And just to confirm on that, that last one for the center guard, um, is that not a great idea because it provides them coverage for draws? Yes. Is that what it's you're saying? Them okay. out by putting guards in play. They want guards in play, which means you don't want guards in play. All right, so now let's talk about drawing in. So it could be down to your own, it could be behind the yellow guard, um, it could be on the center, it could be splitting the house this way. Let's talk about these options. So what's the one thing that we think about as the end progresses? We're gonna switch to hidden, correct? So if we know we're going to hit later, and we know we're going to hit yellow later, right? We're not necessarily going to hit our own, right? So we're going to want a clear path for this yellow to go, to get out of here, right? So we probably don't want that rock. But other than that, I would say any of these are good options. Does everybody see that? Are there any other options that we could have played besides the three that we discussed? Ryan did suggest putting it on top of that shot rock. Yeah, we have, we have that there. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So similar to Ryan's suggestion, we could play the tap back. So we play two there and then move this one to maybe there so that what we end up with, let me clear the board here. So that what we end up with is that, right? And so we're basically, we're filling the forefoot. We're making our opponent have to throw a double at some point to score. And if they're hitting, right, we've 
forced them into playing defensive when they want to play offensive, right? So tapping the, the red one up a little bit is not a bad option as well. Um, I do like the freeze as an option as well. And I do like splitting the house as well. Those are all good options, right? Everybody understands that? Everybody sees the, the reasons behind it? Any questions? In this kind of scenario, when you're essentially just wanting to prevent them from getting many rocks in play at all, I feel like the two options are either cluttering up the top of the house with a bunch of guards so that there's just no way in, or, you know, unless there's some lucky shot where they happen to like take a guard and something rolls in, but either way, they're not going to be able to get enough rocks in play to score and win or playing a very clean house game where they just simply never have enough stones. Like they're mathematically eliminated because they don't have enough rocks that can still be in play. And so is there like an advantage to one or the other? Cause it seems like you're favoring sort of the emptier house strategy. So I was just curious about that. Right, so you remember what we were saying earlier about how playing to your opponent's strengths and weaknesses can affect your shot calling. Your opponent wants guards in play. And so by putting a guard in play, you're helping them. Um, so the, the textbook here says to play into the rings at a minimum, to play hits when possible. Right, the fewer yellow stones there are in play, the less likely they can score three. Um, so the textbook says to, to play a very defensive strategy in an end like this, um, primarily because you don't want to give them what they want. Does that make sense, Isabella? Yeah, that's a yes. That's a yes, okay. Any other questions? I think, yep, that was it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Now we have a little bit of time for questions, conversation, uh, anything that we didn't go over that people are curious about. We're happy to have a little bit of time to talk. Any other questions for Matt? <laughs> Is anything on anyone's mind? Okay, I have another sort of question. I was just yeah, exactly. <laughs> waiting to see if anyone else had stuff since I've taken some airtime already. But um, I feel like a situation that I've come into a lot is the like surprise, oh crap, they're sitting five and we have like <laughs> one or two stones left where you know you feel like you've set up a good end and all that kind of stuff but i guess this is sort of where the whole cluttered um guard situation comes to play where i've had many games where not even by you know skill level just by chance that they've thrown some kind of hail mary shot that has tapped like four stones into play and now they're sitting and you have you know no way to get to get all of them because there's still so many guards yeah, um, so and a very hard our, shot at drawing and reducing what's happened. So I feel like the way that I've been able to avoid that is always playing clean house, like just take everything out, just play very defensive. I always want to say that that's offensive, so I always have to catch myself. Yeah. Um, but so I feel like now that I've been much more successful with playing clean house, clean house, clean house, and so I'm kind of curious why you'd almost ever want to play the other way. Because I feel like I always got stuck in traps when I played the other way. Yeah, so you, you kind of brought up two things. I'm going to hit both of them. But the, the first one was the surprise, oh, no, they're sitting five. Uh, more often than not, that happens when um, you are you have one rock in a good position and you're doing everything you can to protect that one rock. And somehow they get that one rock out and then they're sitting five, right? Um, so whether it be, you know, you, you put the guard up, they hit the guard and roll. You put another guard up, they hit the guard and roll, so on and so forth, and it keeps happening. Um, and then you get what we call uh, the, a, a flob, an, an effing little outside biter, right? So you get all these little flobs out there um, that are just biting along the outside. And once your one rock in the center goes away, all of a sudden those come into play. So you've been ignoring them the whole time because they're so far out. Um, and, and you got to be really careful. So Oftentimes what happens, um, 
you uh, throw the guard up, you keep protecting, you keep protecting. If you miss one of those guards, you're in real trouble. So sometimes what you might see is rather than putting the guard up again, um, is you might hit and roll to a guard position so that you're getting one of their rocks out, but also finding yourself in a guard position to protect that one rock. Or rather than playing a guard, you try to split the house to make sure that um, your opponent can't hit both rocks out. And when you split the house, we didn't really go over this. When you split the house, you wanna make sure that the rocks are even. So if your first rock is in the top eight and you split to the other side, you wanna make sure that that rock is also in the top eight because it prevents a double. Um, when you have relatively good angles, it makes it easier for them to make doubles. So um, that's one, one option, uh, sort of a, a balanced way of thinking about it is the, the guard is working for now, but if we miss that guard, we're in a bunch of trouble. So let's hit and roll to a guarded position. Um, your, your second question, I think, was more, why would you call an offensive strategy uh, when the defensive strategy tends to work better? And the answer to that is uh, it's working better probably because you and your team are better at making hits than draws right now. Uh, but if you, as you develop as a curler over time, what you're gonna find is the offensive strategy gets you more likely to score bigger ends. So it's higher risk, but it's higher reward. And the longer you go in uh, your ability, your, your experience in skipping, you're gonna become more and more comfortable with taking those risks. And the more comfortable you get with risk taking, the more you're gonna to lean towards offensive strategy. Does that answer your question, Isabella? Yes, it does, thank you. You're very welcome. We did have one from Ryan Olson who asks if you have any tips, Matt, on just helping to improve team communication uh, during an end and while a, a shot is actively taking place? Yes, I love this question. Thank you, Ryan. So particularly when you're playing with newer curlers, they're going to say things that they think make sense, but doesn't actually give you information. So for example, they're going to say the weight is good. And the response to the weight is good, in my opinion, should always be good for what? because I need to understand that you, sweeper, understand what we're trying to do. So rather than saying the weight is good, I would prefer my team to say, it's a guard, it's in the house, I think it's heavy, something that gives you substantive information rather than the weight is good. Um, the other thing I will say is when you're asking your teammate to uh, tell you how much of the rock they can see, because if you're trying to decide if you should hit it or not, 99% of the time, they're going to say about half, <laughs> right? It's always about half. Well, is it a little more than half or a little less than half? Because that could make the difference between us trying to hit it or not. So what I like to use is fifths, and everybody laughs at me. Fifths, why fifths? Why not eighths? Why not 30 seconds? Um, and the answer is because when you use fifths, you can't be half, <laughs> right? So you're either two fifths or you're three fifths. You're not half. Um, so that's another that's another one that I like to uh, to always give the tip for. Um, Ryan, does that answer your question? Good. Thumbs up. All right. Anybody else? We have anything else for anyone? And I did see that Andrea dropped our, our link in the chat um, to our video library at curleroutreach.org. So definitely check that out if you're interested in more resources like this. We have a lot of recorded webinars just like this that are free and available to you. And we have some exclusive webinars that would be available to you for uh, just a measly $5 USD if you're interested in purchasing those as well. Um, all those proceeds go right back into our business. And it's really just all, all geared to making more content like this available to, to you guys. So um, if we have no other questions, I, I just want to thank Matt. Thank you so much for your work and your time on this one. Um, awesome graphics. I'm going to, I'm going to, 
put a little shout out to my friends over at uh, Rail City Curling Club. I see your names here, even though you guys were quiet the whole night. So thanks for coming tonight, guys. Um, and uh, oh, there's John. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I see awesome Katie crowd tonight. Good to see you again, Katie. Uh, I saw a few other familiar faces. Um, so happy to see familiar faces and happy to meet a bunch of new people. Um, Feel free, any of you, to uh, friend me on Facebook. Uh, I do post a lot about curling um, and food. So <laughs> two good things. <laughs> Woohoo! Love that. Yeah, thank you to GNCC. This one was fun to, to work with you guys on. So absolutely stay up to date with GNCC through their website and their Facebook and their Twitter. And Curler Outreach is also on Facebook and Twitter. And you'll definitely want to have us liked as we move into the holiday season here. We have a couple of, of uh, drawing, like kind of, you know, freebies essentially for you to take care of. So feel free to like us. Um, and with that, if we have nothing else, I think we're, we're good to call it. So and hopefully we'll see all of you again soon. Curler Outreach team. We appreciate you guys. And yeah, uh, thank look you. To the next one with you all. Awesome. Awesome. Good night. Bye everyone.